Meet Teyu Asana, a high schooler who struggles to connect with others after a tragic car crash took his family. His only friend is Mutsumi Azakura, a top spy. But there's a catch, Mutsumi's brother, Kaiwi Wakairu, is dangerously obsessed with her. To survive, Teyu must marry Mutsumi and join her spy family. Now, he's thrust into a world of chaos, becoming a spy to protect his wife and uncover secrets about his past and the Yazakura family. Without delaying any further, let's get started. A tragic event struck Teyu Asana, a high school student, when he lost his entire family in a car accident, leaving him as the sole survivor. Sitting at his family's funeral, he reflects on how people often realize the true value of something only after it's gone. Seeing his childhood friend, Matsumi Yazakura, grieving, he questions if forming bonds with loved ones will only lead to losing them. The fear of losing Matsumi, his only remaining close connection, terrifies Teo. He struggles to contain his emotions, fearing the thought of her demise. Matsumi notices his distress and reassures him, holding his hand tightly and promising she won't leave him alone. After the accident, Teo becomes withdrawn from his classmates, preferring solitude and feeling uneasy in their presence. Despite repeated invitations to join them for activities like soccer practice or karaoke, he declines each time, resembling someone playing hard to get. Despite his friend's efforts to include him, Teo remains distant, visibly distressed and on the brink of collapse. Realizing Teo's distress, his friends reluctantly back off, aware that pushing him further could worsen his condition. Determined to help him, they decide to try again another day, hoping to eventually bring him back into their social circle. Teo feels guilty for declining his friends' invitations because he doesn't dislike them at all. Actually, he's happy they asked him, but he has his own reasons for saying no. Just then, Matsumi arrives and asks Teo if he rejected his friends again. Surprisingly, Teo can easily talk to her without experiencing panic attacks. Since Teo is always busy with work, he doesn't have time to make his own meals. So, Matsumi often prepares his lunch and delivers it, making sure he doesn't skip his veggies. She expresses concern for Teo's situation and his lack of adherence to social norms, like any caring mother would. Teo is quick to remind her that she shouldn't talk like that, as she also rejected a boy despite his intelligence, good looks, and position as the soccer team captain. Matsumi brushes off Teo's remark and advises him to move on, as it would sadden their parents watching from heaven. She offers him an egg roll from the lunchbox, but before Teo can eat it, their teacher, Hurakawa, interrupts, praising the taste of the food with excessive enthusiasm. Matsumi appears irritated and questions why Hurakawa is present when he was supposed to be away for an overseas lecture. Hurakawa responds arrogantly, stating that he rescheduled his plans because he missed Matsumi's cooking so much, deciding to return home early. His behavior comes across as domineering. He continues, complimenting Matsumi's white hair streak and expressing a desire to touch her cheek. Matsumi threatens to report him for harassment, causing him to cease his inappropriate remarks momentarily. However, he remains smug and shifts his attention to Teo, instructing him to meet in his office after school. This request makes Teo nervous, but Matsumi remains silent. Once school ends, Teo heads to the vice principal's office, where he finds himself in a very awkward situation with Hurakawa. Hurakawa doesn't seem to understand personal boundaries, which makes Teo uncomfortable. To make matters worse, Hurakawa shows Teo his secret collection of photos of Matsumi on his phone, including some questionable ones. Teo feels disgusted by Hurakawa's behavior and considers reporting him. Teo's discomfort escalates when Hurakawa starts showing him childhood photos of Matsumi. Teo wonders how Hurakawa got hold of these pictures. Hurakawa claims he's been protecting Matsumi from unwanted attention citing an incident where he intervened in a confession from a third-year student. However, Teo realizes that Hurakawa's idea of protection involves violence. As expected, Hurakawa becomes hostile towards Teo out of jealousy towards his friendship with Matsumi. Teo, feeling trapped, worries for Matsumi's safety until he realizes that Hurakawa refers to her as his kid sister. Just as Teo fears for his safety, a silver-haired woman dressed like a doll suddenly appears at the window and rescues him using blinding lights. When Teo opens his eyes, he sees several unfamiliar faces looking at him. Matsumi is the first to greet him, but Teo feels disoriented and doesn't recognize the people or the place. He panics and moves away from them, asking who they are. Matsumi calmly explains that they are her siblings. The silver-haired woman who rescued Teo is Matsumi's elder sister, Futaba. Futaba introduces her other siblings, Shinzo who is skilled with technology, Shin, a professional gamer, Kengo, known for being cool, Nano, who is very shy but incredibly smart, and their guard dog, Goliath, who looks like a black cat. She reveals that they are a family of spies, a secret she had to keep hidden for over 10 years, and now feels relieved to share. 
However, Teo feels overwhelmed by this revelation. He had believed Matsumi's family were just ordinary greengrocers, dealing with vegetables like eggplants and radishes, not guns and intelligence. Teo thinks Matsumi is playing a prank on him and decides to test it by picking up one of Shinzo's guns and pretending to fire it, only to frighten himself even more. As freelance spies, their reputation is quite good. Their eldest brother, Kawakara, who turns out to be Hurakawa, is highly respected among spies and plays a crucial role in boosting their family's reputation. Despite his perverted behavior, Kawakaro is incredibly skilled in combat and intelligence, making him the top spy in their family. However, Teo is confused and asks why he was targeted by Kawakaro. The family explains that they received a tip indicating that Matsumi's life was in danger, as someone was planning to harm her. Futaba reveals that years ago, Matsumi was seriously injured in an incident involving Kawakaro. The white streak in Matsumi's hair is a reminder of the stress from that accident. Since then, Kayo Akero has been plagued by guilt and developed an abnormal obsession with Matsumi. This is why he changed his name and took a job at her school to keep a close watch on her. His obsession leads him to interfere in every aspect of Matsumi's life, despite being a monster who protects her and has tolerated Teo despite his hatred for him. Now that he has received the tip, Kayo Akero has more than enough reason to target Teo. Futaba apologizes to Teo for her brother's behavior. Suddenly, the alarm blares, indicating that Kayo Akero has returned home. The siblings assure Teo that he is safest with them, as they have set traps from the entrance to the living room where they are gathered. Despite their preparations, they acknowledge the risks, a 30% chance of success, a 42% chance of one of them needing six months to recover, and a 25% chance of the house burning down. Seeing Teo hesitate, Futaba reveals the only way he can survive is by marrying Matsumi. According to the peace treaty within their family, no member is allowed to harm another. To formalize the marriage, they must exchange the family's cherry blossom ring, worn by every member. The ring is divided into two bands, and once one gives their half to their spouse, the marriage becomes official. This action would protect Teo from Kawakaro's anger and potentially help Kawakairo move past his obsession with his sister. Teo struggles with the decision. So Matsumi steps in and declines, citing Teo's recent loss and ongoing struggle to rebuild his life. She believes it would be unfair to casually ask him to join their family. Futaba apologizes for her insensitivity, and they prepare to handle the situation when Kaiwa Kairo unexpectedly arrives and complains about feeling left out. Everyone tenses up as they didn't notice his approach. Futaba warns him to stay away from Teo, but Kaiwa Kairo declares war, vowing not to relent until Teo is proven innocent. Fed up, Futaba grabs Kaiwa Kairo by his tie and slams him onto the couch. Despite Nanao and Shinzo's attempts to overpower him, Kaiwa Kairo proves too strong. He threatens to destroy the house unless they hand over Teo, wielding his weapon, Steel Spider. Kengo quickly escorts Teo and Matsumi to safety. As Futaba engages Kaiwa Kairo in battle, he quickly ensnares her with Steel Spider. Shin attempts to stall him with gaming attacks and projectiles, giving Kengo and Matsumi time to escape to a hidden chamber. Before closing the door, Matsumi smiles and assures him that she will not leave. Kaiwa Kairo soon arrives and sees through Matsumi's disguise, reminding her she needs to work on her technique. Teo watches everything from his hidden chamber, feeling helpless. Matsumi tries to persuade Kaiwa Kairo to give up his aggression, and he agrees not to harm Teo. However, he demands Matsumi stay in the house to avoid trouble, forbidding her from using the internet, returning to school, seeing friends, or pursuing romance. He aims to restrict her freedom to keep her safe, which Matsumi reluctantly accepts. As Kaiwa Kairo approaches for a hug, Matsumi's blade pierces his flesh, but he remains unfazed. Matsumi agrees to his terms, prompting Teo to intervene and demand Kaiwa Kairo release her. However, Kaiwa Kairo ignores him. Teo understands Kaiwa Kairo's fear of losing a loved one but realizes it shouldn't lead to that loved one fearing him the most. He suggests they proceed with the first plan Futaba proposed, trusting Matsumi's promise not to leave. Matsumi agrees and throws the upper band of her ring toward Teo, but Kaiwa Kairo intercepts it with his threats. Despite Teo's hand getting cut as he grabs the ring, he's determined to protect Matsumi. Teo pledges to safeguard her and calls Kaiwa Kairo bro as he wears the bloodied ring. Matsumi rushes to hug Teo, and her siblings arrive to celebrate their union. Futaba taunts a stunned Kaiwa Akero, indicating that it's now his turn to teach Teo how to protect Matsumi. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more of the anime episode. This is season 3 of that time I got reincarnated as a slime. The story progresses after Rimuru defeated Clayman and was acknowledged as a demon lord. He mentions that after the meeting concluded, Leon and Valentine left, and they were treated to a meal by Gi. 
Rimuru then tastes one of the dishes, finding it exquisite. He asks Raphael to analyze the recipe. Observing Milam eating without manners, Rimuru feels reassured that he doesn't need to worry about them. He notices Milam attempting to drink liquor and tries to stop her. However, Milam explains that this is her reward for pretending to be controlled. Dagrul remarks that Milam could have ended the act sooner, as Clayman never mentioned the mastermind. Milam responds that she couldn't miss the rare opportunity to fight Rimuru. Rimuru comments that it's too early for her to drink, but Milam persists in trying to take the alcohol from him. Kai wonders if the brandy was made with grapes from Eurasania, and Rimuru confirms it. He thinks they can produce more now that they have a stable fruit supply, and Dagrul notes that Valentine is missing out on a good drink. Rimuru realizes he has many questions for her. Raphael finishes analyzing the recipes, and Volpurgis comes to an end. Rimuru returns to Tempest, where everyone welcomes him with bows. Diablo congratulates him on joining Octagram. Rimuru wonders why he's there, and Rigard suggests they continue talks later as Rimuru must be tired. The scene shifts to Rimuru enjoying tea with Diablo, Shen, and Veldora. A goblin brings pudding for them. Diablo gives his share to Veldora, mentioning it's the first of their promises. Rimuru wonders why Diablo isn't eating his share, and Diablo explains that he promised it to Veldora in exchange for information. Rimuru realizes that Diablo knows about what happened in Valpurgis because Veldora informed him and wonders what Diablo traded the information for. He finds out it was for three puddings and notes that Veldora doesn't need to eat to sustain himself. Veldora agrees that he doesn't need to eat but still enjoys it. He mentions that Rimuru also doesn't have a need to eat. Diablo asks Shin if she fulfilled her role as Rimuru's bodyguard, and Shin confirms she did. She wonders about Diablo's mission, and Diablo mentions it's going well. Rimuru is surprised at Diablo's timely return, and Diablo explains he was attending to some business when Veldora asked him to come back. Veldora attempts to leave, but Rimuru stops him, reminding him not to interfere with others' work. Rimuru takes away Veldora's pudding and instructs the goblin named Haruna not to give Veldora snacks in the future. He then asks Diablo if it's okay for him to stay and inquires about Falmouth's situation. Diablo explains he has insiders managing things in Falmouth and has restored all the prisoners of war to their original condition. Rimuru realizes Diablo is referring to the prisoners tortured by Shin and mentions leaving them as they were was inconvenient. The story then shifts back to when Diablo was heading to Falma. He tries to heal the three prisoners, but healing magic has no effect on them. Diablo wonders what Shin did to them and proceeds to heal one of them using magic, hearing their screams. Ahem and the others hope the prisoners will be okay by the time they reach Falma. Diablo restores Father Rahim to his original state, and the father thanks him. He then tries to heal Raisin, but Raisin asks him to attend to his king first. Diablo warns that favors will come at a cost, but heals Raisin nonetheless. Raisin hopes Diablo will allow him to serve as his lowest servant, offering his body and soul for Diablo's use and asking for mercy for King Admaris. Diablo agrees to the terms but emphasizes that he won't tolerate any disrespect towards his lord, Rimuru. He warns that even a hint of disrespect towards Rimuru could lead to dire consequence, possibly endangering the very existence of Falma. Raisin and Rahim agree to Diablo's conditions, pledging their loyalty to him. Raisin reflects on his torture and expresses disbelief at the betrayal of the royal sorcerer who served Falmouth for generations. He acknowledges Raisin's decision and promises Diablo his full support as Falmouth's final king. Diablo instructs them to follow his orders, assuring them that they won't suffer under his command. He relies on his unique skill, Tempter, to prevent any betrayal. Yom asks about the hostages, and Diablo assures him they are fine, adding that they will soon arrive in Falmouth. He resolves to swiftly execute the national takeover upon their arrival. As they enter Falmouth, the scene shifts to the minister and court, who are shocked by the disfigured king. They express frustration at their inability to restore the king's normal appearance. They inquire about the situation, and Raisin clarifies that he is not Shogo. He introduces himself and explains that he worked with the champions and returned with the king. The ministers are uncertain if this means that Falmouth's forces were defeated and they have numerous questions. One of them calls for everyone to calm down and listen to what Raisin has to say first. Raisin explains that their battle awakened the slumbering dragon in the Jura forest, causing everyone to vanish at the time of its rebirth. The ministers are puzzled as the Western Holy Church had declared the dragon dead. Raisin clarifies that while the dragon was indeed slain, true dragons cannot be permanently killed, they are reborn elsewhere. It was unexpected that the dragon's rebirth occurred so nearby, and swiftly. The knights and soldiers fighting on the land disappeared after Veldora's resurrection, leaving only them behind. The ministers find this difficult to believe as it, and the champions enter the throne room. One of the ministers questions why commoners like them are entering the throne room. 
Raisin asks Minister Carlos to calm down, explaining that this group saved them. The ministers struggle to comprehend the situation. Riaiheim elaborates that it was a fierce battle where both sides clashed, with their outnumbering the monster. But the monsters had the geographical advantage, resulting in significant casualties. The chaos of the battle led to Veldora's resurrection, and facing the dragon, all they could do was offer their final prayers. Raisin explains that Rimuru, the master of monsters, stood up against the dragon and persuaded it to calm down. The ministers find this difficult to believe, but Raisin points out that Rimuru had the support of the dragons and collaborated with them to negotiate with Veldora. The ministers are astounded that Rimuru also has the dragons on his side realizing that provoking him was a serious mistake if he possesses the ability to negotiate with the dragon. Yelm assures them that they needn't worry because he aided Rimuru in defeating the Orc Lore, and Rimuru is actually a benevolent individual who wishes to coexist peacefully with humans. Carlos suggests that Yung should act as their representative and convey their demands to Rimuru, deciding to inform him of their demands at a later time. Yung argues that this won't work because Rimuru, despite being open-hearted, is currently furious due to their declaration of war against his nation and the loss of his comrades. Carlos angrily questions if Yom is on Rimuru's side, and Diablo, angered by his disrespect toward his master, intervenes. This startles Raisin, who urges Carlos to remain calm, but Carlos disregards his advice and asserts that a commoner like Yom has no right to speak on matters concerning the kingdom. Diablo becomes even more furious, and Raisin uses a spell to immobilize Carlos instructing him not to speak until he comprehends the situation. He then confirms to the ministers that Yom is speaking the truth, stating that they have lost the war. King Admaris was affected by the storm dragon's magic, and they witness his condition first. Having been held captive and released thanks to Yom's word as a champion, the ministers contemplate yielding to a nation of monsters, recognizing their disadvantage with the storm dragon on their side. One of them suggests accepting the offer. Diablo approves of this decision, promising to release their king as agreed. The soldiers become wary of him standing so close to the king and question his identity. Diablo introduces himself as Rimuru's butler and uses a potion to heal King Admaris. He then delivers a message from Rimuru, outlining the terms of peace talks scheduled for a week later. Rimuru offers three options. The king abdicates and pays reparations. They become a vassal state, or they continue the war. The ministers express concern about the short time frame for a decision but Diablo dismisses their objections, emphasizing that Rimuru's concerns outweigh theirs. Diablo warns them not to resort to any tricks and gives them a week to respond, stating that failure to reply will be interpreted as a desire to continue the war. With that, he exits the throne room. The story returns to the present, with Diablo explaining how he applied pressure on everyone, leaving Rimuru astonished that Diablo revealed such a strategy. Diablo explains that instilling fear was the most effective approach, and Rimuru is curious about the terms proposed for the peace treaty. Diablo reveals that he requested 10,000 stellas in reparations, equivalent to 1 trillion yen. Rimuru finds this demand excessive, but Diablo assures him not to be concerned. He clarifies that Falmouth has only one viable option, abdication and payment of reparations, possibly with negotiations to reduce the amount. Diablo indicates that they will likely comply with lowering the price, and shift the burden of payment onto a third party. Rimuru wonders about their next steps, and Diablo reassures him, saying he has everything planned. He assures that they'll be able to reclaim at least a thousand stellas. Rimuru inquires about the plan afterward, and Diablo explains that once they choose the abdication option, King Admaris will take the fall for the crisis. Rimuru realizes that he's the third party Diablo mentioned earlier. Diablo predicts that without the royal guard, the king won't be able to oppose the noble and will have to fulfill their demands, albeit superficially. Rimuru understands that without military support, the king's faction will lose to the noble's faction, suggesting that absorbing Ihim's faction is the best strategy to maintain cooperation. In this scenario, Edmaris would ally with Ihim and others. Rimuru suggests lending some forces to Yom, and Diablo anticipates that Raisin will contact him soon. Rimuru questions if this strategy will ensure victory, and Diablo assures him that the next king won't be able to form alliances with neighboring nations. He explains that Fuse and Gazelle are already leveraging their influence to pressure Falmouth's neighbors, but he's prepared to handle any opposition personally. Diablo urges Rimuru not to worry and agrees to leave everything to him. This bring an end to our episode 1. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more episodes. The story begins with Oscar and Lazar sneaking out of the castle together, heading towards the Azure Tower. They travel across the desert on horseback. Along the journey, Lazar continuously pleads with Oscar to turn back and return to the castle. However, Oscar is resolute in his desire to climb the Azure Tower. 
He believes that going back to the castle would defeat the purpose of sneaking out. Both Oscar and Lazar have their own reasons for embarking on this journey. Although Lazar is worried about the potential dangers, he refuses to leave Oscar's side and accompanies him. He cautions Oscar about the curse that befell him previously and the potential consequences of encountering the witch again. Despite Lazar's warnings, Oscar insists that he has no alternative. He reassures Lazar that if any trouble arises, he will deal with it later. Lazar expresses his fear of encountering danger along the way. He suggests that they should return to the safety of the castle in time. However, Oscar counters that he has spent the past 15 years searching for another solution without success. Therefore, feeling like he has no other choice, he continues towards the Azure Tower, home to the Witch of the Azure Moon. Legend has it that anyone who climbs the Witch's Tower and passes her trials will be granted any wish they desire. Oscar believes in this legend, but he also acknowledges that if their attempt fails, they will have to find another solution. Despite Lazar's persistent pleas for them to turn back, Oscar remains determined that he will not retreat, no matter what challenges they may face. Lazar mentions that nobody has seen the Witch of Silence for the past 15 years, and for the same period, no one has successfully reached the top of the Azure Tower, where the Witch of the Azure Moon resides. Despite this, Oscar remains steadfast in his belief that he can accomplish this feat. Lazar questions how Oscar plans to return to the castle alone if he fails to reach the top. Even though Lazar doubts Oscar's ability, Oscar remains determined and boldly opens the door to the tower. Lazar urges Oscar to be cautious as they enter. Inside the tower, Oscar is amazed by what he sees, while Lazar warns him of the dangers they might encounter. However, Lazar underestimates the challenges that Oscar will face. Ignoring Lazar's warnings, Oscar prepares to ascend the tower. He is unwavering in his resolve to reach the top and fulfill his wish to the witch. With determination, Oscar begins his ascent paying no heed to Lazar's attempts to dissuade him. Lazar feels frightened, so Oscar advises him to wait there until sunset for safety. He promises to return before the sun sets, as he doesn't want to put Lazar in danger. However, Lazar disagrees and insists on accompanying him. As they proceed, they find themselves surrounded by snakes. Oscar reassures Lazar that the snakes are not poisonous, but this is just the beginning of their challenges. The first hurdle they face is solving a mathematical puzzle that has baffled people for over a hundred years. To their surprise, Oscar quickly solves the puzzle, causing the snakes to vanish. Despite Lazar's suggestion to turn back, Oscar finds the adventure intriguing. As they continue, they encounter the next challenge. Meanwhile, one of the witches of the Azure Moon observes them from the tower with keen interest. Lazar urges Oscar to be cautious and expresses his determination to protect him from harm. Oscar reassures Lazar that he isn't in immediate danger and marvels at how far they've progressed. Lazar estimates that they should be halfway through by now. Oscar then shares that his great-grandfather was the last person known to have reached the top of the tower. Lazar confirms that indeed, it was 70 years ago when his great-grandfather successfully climbed the tower. Ten others attempted but only his great-grandfather made it to the top. Oscar remarks that the challenges seemed manageable until now. Despite Lazar's suggestion to turn back, they proceed. Their second challenge involves facing two stone monsters that merge into one. Oscar skillfully defeats both monsters. Meanwhile, the Witch of the Azure Moon is surprised to learn that someone is breezing through the challenges. She prepares tea for the challenger but is interrupted when Oscar is mentally distressed upon witnessing Lazar falling through the floor. As Lazar encourages Oscar to continue and expresses his belief in Oscar becoming king one day, they encounter a beautiful girl who introduces herself as Tanisi. She cryptically hints that some refer to her by that name. Oscar questions if she is a witch, noting her unconventional appearance. Tanisir responds by questioning the foolishness of judging a witch by appearance. She assures Oscar that his companion is safe, easing his worries. Taking a sip of tea, Oscar asks if she used magic to change her appearance. Tanasha becomes irritated and starts questioning Oscar. He mentions hearing that she has lived for hundreds of years without any wrinkles. Tanasha explains that witches live much longer than humans and that her body has stopped aging. She acknowledges that Oscar is the first to climb the tower mostly on his own in a long time. Oscar, feeling apologetic, introduces himself as Oscar Lyoth from the Creator's Law's farces, revealing his royal lineage. Tanasha is surprised to learn that he is Farsa's royalty and asks if he is a descendant of Regius. Oscar confirms that Regius is his great-grandfather, to Tanasha's astonishment. Tanasha notices the resemblance between Oscar and Regius, albeit with different personalities. She jests about Oscar's appearance, and he responds with a self-deprecating comment. Tanasha laughs and remarks on Oscar's perceived masculinity compared to Regius. Oscar inquires if Tanasha lives alone in the tower. 
Tanasha implies familiarity with her surroundings. Latola arrives and introduces herself, informing Oscar that his companion is under her sleeping spell. Oscar expresses gratitude, prompting Tanasha to inquire about the fate of failed challengers. She becomes angry when Oscar implies that the tower might be associated with death. Tanasha explains that she ensures no one dies in the tower. Those who fail have their memories altered and are sent to different parts of the mainland. She suggests that most challengers seek fame or validation, making it a fair consequence. Batola adds that the witch is kind to those seeking help for their children's illnesses even if they fail. Tanasha scolds Latola for sharing this information with Oscar, indicating that it was unnecessary. Oscar chuckles, finding Tanasha's demeanor intriguing. Tanasha remarks that she may appear mysterious, but it's just his perception. Oscar then asks Tanasha if she ever ventures into town, as he's heard that other witches occasionally interact with humans. Tanasha explains that she prefers not to meddle too much in human affairs and that her powers should be used responsibly, not recklessly. Upon hearing this, Oscar reflects on how he wishes the Witch of Silence had similar principles. Tanasha then questions if his reason for coming to the tower is related to his curse. Oscar reveals that he was cursed by the Witch of Silence when he was young and has been secretive about it ever since. He dedicated himself to breaking the curse, which doomed his bloodline, including any potential heirs. Tanasha inquires about the origin of the curse, but Oscar admits that his father refuses to discuss it, and he's never directly asked him. He suspects it's connected to his late mother's death. Despite his efforts to uncover clues to lift the curse, he's found nothing concrete, which is why he sought help at the tower. After hearing his story, Tanasha cautions Oscar that there's no guarantee a curse can be lifted. She explains that magic operates under specific rules, but curses defy such rules. If a curse is cast without a clear means of breaking it, even the caster might be unable to undo it in extreme cases. Surprised, Oscar questions if Tanasha can't break the curse. Tanasha confirms that indeed, she cannot, explaining that curses lack direct lethal power and can only manifest indirectly. Oscar acknowledges the potency of his curse, to which Tanasha agrees, stating it exceeds typical curses. Tanasha clarifies that what Oscar bears isn't a curse but a variant of a blessing. She touches Oscar's cheek, revealing a visible aspect of the blessing, explaining that blessings and curses are cast similarly but differ in their effect. Blessings enhance existing energy, making them potent depending on the caster's skill. The blessing on Oscar aims to protect unborn children with overwhelming force, making it impossible for a normal mother to bear. She mentions the complexity of the blessing, consisting of multiple layers intertwined, making it challenging to analyze magically. Tanasha apologizes for her inability to break the spell, but assures Oscar that she won't let him leave empty-handed. Oscar inquires if there's a solution to which Tanasha replies affirmatively, suggesting he find a woman who can withstand the protective powers. Oscar questions the existence of such a woman, and Tanasha believes there must be a few on the mainland, selected based on magical aptitude and resistance, disregarding other factors. Oscar worries about potential obstacles like marriage, age, or youthfulness. Tanasha reassures him that if married, morally, he can't intervene, but elderly women may withstand the magic. Regarding children, he could nurture her into his ideal partner. Tanasha points out that marriages with 20-year age gaps are common among royalty, trying to uplift Oscar's spirits. Oscar falls silent, and Tanasha reassures him, mentioning she's found a potential solution. However, this time, Oscar feels disappointed, while Tanasha appears puzzled. When Oscar addresses Tanasha by her name, she becomes frightened and trembles, as nobody usually addresses her by name. Oscar reminds her that he had told her his name earlier. Tanasha apologizes and asks for clarification. Oscar then suggests an unusual idea, prompting Tanasha to agree that she can withstand the Witch of Silence's magical power. However, Oscar becomes nervous himself. He proposes that instead of searching for a possibly non-existent woman, Tanasha could fulfill his wish as the champion to leave the tower and become his wife. Tanasha vehemently rejects this idea, which upsets Oscar, but he insists he's accepted it. Tanasha becomes angry, asserting that such a wish is impossible especially considering the repercussions of introducing witch blood into the royal family. Oscar remains unfazed, but Tanasha warns him of the consequences, threatening to erase his memory and send him back to his castle. They argue back and forth before eventually calming down and agreeing to discuss further. Tanasha remarks on Oscar's unusual insistence. In response, Oscar retorts that he could say the same thing to Tanasha. He then recalls hearing that Tanasha had stayed in Farsa's castle for around six months, 70 years ago, where she taught magic and tended to flowers, enjoying her time there. Oscar wonders if this was his great-grandfather's wish, but Tanasha clarifies that it wasn't. 
Oscar then proposes a deal. He will stay with Tanasha in the tower for one year, and in return, she will accompany him to Pharsis as his protector. Tanasha agrees to his request, and Lazar, who has been unconscious, suggests they return home. Oscar instructs Lazar to go home, surprising him with his sudden decision. Oscar explains that Tanasha will stay at the castle to help him lift the curse, and they will exchange skills. Curiously, Lazar whispers to Oscar, asking if he met the witch and if she ate him alive, to which Oscar laughs. They depart for the castle, where Oscar asks Tanasha if she might change her mind halfway through. Tanasha assures him that she won't. This bring an end to our episode 1. Subscribe my channel for more of this anime episodes. Every year, the magical kingdom of Clyra calls upon hundreds of heroes from different worlds to battle the Dark One and his demon army. Benaza, summoned from Paluma, is among them. But there's a problem, he's just an ordinary merchant. Lacking magic and combat skills, Benaza is stranded in this foreign realm after a mishap prevents his return home. Rejected by the kingdom's king and left to fend for himself in a hostile land, Benaza's prospects seem grim. But what will happen once the failed hero candidate finds himself with super cheat powers once he hits level 2? Without wasting any time let's dive into the first episode of this anime. Our story starts in Paluma's royal capital, bustling with demihumans loading cargo. Amidst the haste, a man threatens them, but Benazo arrives, expressing gratitude for their labor and generously compensating them. He insists they deserve fair pay for their toil, disregarding societal divines. His actions bewilder fellow merchants, viewing his egalitarian approach as peculiar in a world where demihumans are marginalized. Despite their skepticism, Benaza stands by his belief in equality, sharing his earnings without discrimination. As the demihumans depart, Benaza's peers brand him a hypocrite, contrasting his actions with prevailing prejudices. Undeterred, Benaza aspires for harmony between humans and demihumans, albeit his made remarks on his solitary stance. Suddenly, an inexplicable sensation grips Benaza, enveloping him in radiant light before vanishing, leaving his maid bewildered. Benaza finds himself transported to Clyro, greeted as a hero candidate by the kingdom's saint, marking the commencement of his journey in this new realm. The saint urgently informs Benaza of an impending dark army threatening their kingdom, seeking aid from heroes summoned across dimensions. Benaza, asserting his identity as a humble merchant, doubts his heroic status, but the summoners insist on assessing his magical potential. According to lore, summoned heroes are bestowed divine favor, their powers transcending ordinary mortal limits. Placing his hand on the magic crystal ball, Benaza's mundane stats appear, disappointing the onlookers expecting a chosen savior. With Benaza's unremarkable level 1 skills, doubts arise about the summoning ritual's efficacy. Suddenly, a divine revelation alters the narrative amplifying each skill to an unprecedented 999 points. Realizing Benaza's unexpected prowess, the summoners implore him to safeguard their realm with his newfound immense magic, acknowledging him as the hero their kingdom desperately needs. Benaza pleads with them to send him back to his old world, but his request falls on deaf ears as the people ignore him, leaving him to wander the castle alone, grappling with disbelief at finding himself in another realm. Seeking clarity, he approaches the king only to learn from his retainer that the gate through which he was summoned has closed, trapping him in this unfamiliar land indefinitely due to insufficient mana power in his world to reopen it. Offered residence in the Daleves of Forest under the condition of secrecy regarding the summoning mishap, Benaza is dismissed as a hero and dispatched to the forest. Along the journey, he attempts to glean insights about this world from the demihuman accompanying him, only to be instructed to remain silent until they reach their destination. Benaza, accustomed to the concept of slavery in his own world, is surprised to learn of the absence of such oppression here, where humans and demihumans coexist harmoniously. Arriving at the Delaves of Forest, the demihuman presents him with a bottomless bag, a gift from the king intended for Benaza. Benaza is relieved to find the familiar bottomless bag in this new world, its contents providing him with essential items like money and food to sustain him. The demihuman advises him to leave the forest swiftly for his safety. A warning Benaza tucks away despite his lack of knowledge about the kingdom's geography. As he delves into the bag, Benaza discovers it functions just like its counterpart in his world. He examines the bestowed sword for protection, only to be startled by the appearance of slimes. Initially dismissing them as harmless, Benaza is compelled to fend them off when they pose a threat. To his astonishment, Benaza's stats display a level up from 1 to 2, defying what he had been told about the world's level cap. Intrigued by this development, he notices an infinity symbol among his skills, prompting him to activate a newfound ability to communicate with the system. The system enlightens him about the magic spells he has acquired through leveling up, revealing unexpected capabilities waiting to be explored. 
Benaza is astonished by the multitude of spells he gained simply by defeating the seemingly insignificant slimes. Despite his newfound power, he prioritizes finding a secure haven in the forest for his protection. However, the system alerts him to the forest's contamination with molybdenum, hazardous substances emitted by demons. Curious, Benaza inquires about molybdenum, learning of its harmful effects on humanoid races. Undeterred by the risk, he instructs the system to purify the forest, willing to sacrifice a portion of his magic power for safety. Witnessing the system's formidable purification magic, Benaza is amazed by its potency and his subsequent level up. Meanwhile, within the royal palace, the first princess berates the king for neglecting the summoned hero candidate's well-being, fearing his demise at the hands of the Dark Army. Dismissing Benaza as inconsequential, the king shows no concern. However, a saint's revelation about recent use of the highest holy magic, purification, in the Delaves of Forest shocks the king, prompting suspicions about the hero's involvement. In the forest, Benaza is amazed to discover he's leveled up without battling any monsters. He speculates that using magic might be the key to leveling up in this world. Curious about his magical reserves, he asks the system to display his remaining magic, and to his astonishment, it's fully restored. The system suggests a shapeshifting spell, anticipating its usefulness. Benaza agrees, and the system transforms him first into a hot girl, then into a man he deems inconspicuous. Delighted with his new ability, he requests teleportation back to the kingdom. After returning, Benaza realizes he can't use the magic to return to his world, prompting him to seek employment at the Adventure Guild. Inside, the guild lady explains the registration process, prompting Benaza to provide a false name, Fleo. She assigns him a badge, crucial for determining an adventurer's rank. Fleo obliges and approaches the quest board to find a suitable task for his rank. To his surprise, he encounters a young girl pleading for an escort to the Delaves of Forest, offering payment as her family resides there. However, the adventurers around dismiss her request, fearing the forest's demon-infested reputation. Taking pity on the girl, Fleo accepts the job, astonishing her with his willingness. To reassure her, Fleo mentions his teleportation spell, sparking disbelief among the onlookers. This revelation makes Fleo realize the spell's significance, reserved for advanced sorcerers, not novices like him. Suddenly, Royal Knight Balarasa and her companions appear, challenging Fleo to prove his claim. They express skepticism, deeming such magic beyond his capabilities. However, Fleo stands by his assertion, prompting Balarasa to demand an explanation. Apologizing for her skepticism, Bilarasa listens as the girl reveals the forest's malice has vanished, adding another layer of intrigue to the situation. Just as Fleo is about to reveal his role in purifying the forest, the system warns him against sharing information with demons. The girls, armed and ready, encircle the little girl, who is exposed as a demon using a disguise spell. Balarasa identifies her as Fenris, the younger sibling of Fengarl from the Infernal Four. Recognizing the danger, Balarasa acknowledges their inferiority against such a formidable demon lupine. Fenris unleashes her malicium attack, incapacitating the girls. Surprisingly, Fleo remains unaffected by the assault. Enraged, Fenris attempts to devour them, but Fleo rescues them with teleportation magic, resolving to confront Fenris alone. With determination, Fleo vows to utilize all his magic spells to combat Fenris and protect the kingdom. This bring an end to episode 1. More of the anime episode will be uploaded in my channel so don't forget to like, share and subscribe. The anime starts with our main character, Tamokui Kanata, being brutally attacked by a wild lady who seems to derive pleasure from it. Despite the pain, Kanata remains silent, his lifeless eyes fixated on the moon above. The lady calls out his name, but Kanata is indifferent, as he knows he is already dead. Upon awakening, Kanata finds himself face to face with an old goblin, bewildered by his own existence and the presence of the green creature. The old goblin decides to name them Gopkichi and Gabru respectively. Kanata, now Gabru, expresses disappointment at the lack of effort in the naming process. The old goblin then stuffs a bug into Gabru's mouth, prompting a groggy response. The next day, Gabru finds himself surrounded by other goblins, realizing he too has become one of them. The realization of his transformation into a helpless goblin overwhelms him, leading to tears. As days pass, Gabru notices rapid growth in his body, realizing that goblins mature much faster than expected. Determined to survive, he embraces his new life with optimism. On the fourth day, the old goblin gives them some bugs and informs everyone that this will be the last food they'll get from him. He will no longer provide food. Gabru and the goblins enjoy their last free meal. Stepping outside, 
Gabru takes in the sight of one sun shining in a blue sky, yet it's filled with strange, unsettling birds, and there are unfamiliar plants all around, signaling that this world is unlike anything he's known. Gob Kichai steps out too and also marvel at the sights around them, both admitting it's their first time seeing the outside world. Taking a moment, Gabru introduces himself and teaches Gob Kichai his name, forming a bond between them. Their goal, to hunt for food. As they explore, they stumble upon a horned rabbit grazing peacefully. With Gob Kichai's help, Gabru positions himself strategically, ready to strike. As the rabbit approaches, Gabru swiftly brings it down with a well-aimed blow from his stick. However, their joy is short-lived when Gob Kichai moves to devour the catch alone. Frustrated, Gabru insists they share, resorting to gentle persuasion with his stick to enforce the lesson of cooperation. Gob Kichai, not far behind, marvels at the unfamiliar world outside, expressing his awe at its newness. Sharing the same sentiment, on the sixth day, Gabru and Gob Kichai met Gobmi. She seemed impressed by their hunting skills and ability to eat horn rabbits. Gobmi shared a sad story about someone who was killed by a creature named Gobru. It was quite surprising. Gob Kichai wanted some praise too, but Gobmi told him he was just average. The leader asked Gobmi if she wanted to join their hunt the next day. She happily agreed and hugged Gobru. However, they couldn't go hunting when the time came because it was raining. So, they postponed the hunt until the following day. Gobru used this indoor time to check what supplies they had. He also tried to make a new weapon. Gabru found some ore and began refining it with a rock. While he worked, he couldn't help but think about the human captives nearby and their unfortunate situation. He tried to push those thoughts aside, and Gob Kichai helped by starting a conversation and telling him he seemed motivated. The seasoned goblin observes that Gabru might level up faster than anticipated upon a closer look. This is the first time the young one hears about this leveling idea. Gabji educates him about the gestures used to display one's level. Gabru taps his head, and the system notifies him that Gobji is at level 86. The elder reveals that upon reaching level 100, one can evolve into a more advanced being. This achievement is quite rare, as only one out of every dozen goblins manages to accomplish it. Gabru notes mentally that goblins age rapidly, as Gobji, despite being in his 20 seconds, appears to be on his last legs. The old goblin informs Gabru that the goblins in their prime will return soon. When they do, the newborns will witness what an evolved hobgoblin looks like. However, Gobji is more interested in seeing what kind of prey they will bring this time. It has been eight days since Gabru's reincarnation. Gobmi joins them on their hunt and hits a monster snake with a slingshot. This provides an opportunity for the boss to take it down. They employ their new tactics to hunt a variety of prey. Gobmi acts as support, while Gabru takes the mid-range position, and Gabkichi leads the charge with his formidable power. They successfully skin a snake they hunted allowing them to savor their catch. Gobmi becomes emotional, expressing her dissatisfaction with only eating fruits like a herbivore. The leader of the group takes a bite of the snake and gains the ability to produce venom, along with resistance to it and other skills. He recognizes the snake as high level due to the new abilities he acquired. Gabru prevents Gabkichi from consuming the poisonous head, relying on his resistance. Despite the challenges, Gabru is determined to survive in his second life. On the ninth and tenth days, the trio prepares their gear and embarks on their usual hunting trip. They encounter bats in a cave initially overwhelming them, but Gabru uses his evil eye to stun them, making it easier to defeat them. During the feast, Gabru gains new abilities like echolocation and vamphilia, impressing their peers who wish for such nutritious food. On the twelfth night, jealous goblins attempt to ambush Gabru while he sleeps, but his search ability alerts him, enabling him to fend off the attackers. Unfortunately, one of them succumbs to the venom used by Gabru. Witnessing this, the others back down. Out of frustration, Gabmi begins choking one of the defeated goblins, prompting the boss to intervene. On the 13th day, the trio executes a well-coordinated attack, successfully defeating their first orc. After consuming its meat, Gabru gains the ability to speak the orc language, along with other traits. Feeling generous, he suggests sharing some meat with the others in the cave, realizing the importance of unity after the recent attack. Initially hesitant, the other goblins eventually accept the offer, thanking Gabru for his kindness. Reflecting on his changed behavior, Gabru realizes that his perspective on helping others has evolved since his previous life. That night, as he sleeps, the system notifies him that he has fulfilled special conditions and offers him the chance to evolve into a hobgoblin, which he eagerly accepts. Awakening on the 14th morning, Gabru notices his increased size and appearance resembling his previous form. Gabkichi also notices his transformation, and Gabmi praises their enhanced appearance. They are surprised by their rapid progress, achieving a rank up in less than a month since their birth, an unprecedented feat. Gabkichi wants to gauge his newfound strength, 
so he proposes a sparring match with Gaburu. They venture to a secluded part of the forest where they engage in a fierce brawl. Despite Gibkich's impressive power, Gaburu, the goblin Chad, emerges victorious. Their duel is interrupted when Gaburu senses impending danger. Aware that Gami was observing them, Gaburu calls her forth and instructs her to wield the crossbow they crafted earlier. Meanwhile, a pack of wolves begins hunting horn rabbits, driving them into goblin territory. After feasting on the rabbits, the wolves spot an orc and target him as their next prey. The trio, observing from a distance, sees an opportunity to test their evolved strength against the wolves. Gabru signals Gami to initiate the attack by targeting the wolf pack's leader with a well-aimed shot from her crossbow. As chaos erupts, Gabkichi and Gabru engage the wolves head-on, swiftly overpowering them. The absence of their leader leaves the black wolves disorganized and vulnerable. Despite a fierce struggle, Gami and Gabkichi emerge victorious, standing triumphantly over the defeated wolves. Although the wolf leader attempts to rise again, Gami delivers the final blow, ensuring their victory. Gabru wastes no time sinking his teeth into the meat, immediately gaining new abilities, wild hunt, hides armor, and order. These skills grant him military leadership prowess. Together with Gabkichi and Gabmi, they present their impressive catch to the rest of the goblin horde, who are duly impressed. Gabru, however, seeks no gratitude. He merely expects them to match their hunting efforts. Some of the horde members express concern about meeting such a high quota. Worried, they plead with Gabru not to punish them. Recognizing their lack of combat skills, Gabru decides to teach them how to defend themselves and even offers to instruct them in weapon crafting. Encouraging them to stand up as comrades, Gabru earns their admiration and loyalty. They hail him as a good leader, chanting his name in unison. Whether it's due to the order ability he acquired or some other influence, Gabru feels a sense of clarity about his path forward to grow stronger, lead his comrades, and achieve his goals. With a sly grin, he contemplates his secret plans. By the 17th day, progress is evident, but there's still much to learn. Returning to the cave, Gabru is pleased to find that Gabmi has also evolved into a hobgoblin. She flashes him a cute smile, marking the end of the episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel. When Zagan, a formidable sorcerer, ventures into an auction for the possessions of the deceased archdemon, he anticipates uncovering potent relics. Yet, amidst the array of items, he is captivated by the presence of Nephilia, a rare white-haired elf being auctioned as a slave. Zagan impulsively spends his entire fortune to acquire her, by an immediate and undisclosed attraction. However, Zagan faces a challenge. He struggles with social interactions and expressing his emotion. Will he be able to overcome his social issues and express his love for Nephilia? The story begins with a soldier named Myers assaulting a girl. She demands to know why, only to discover that the soldier is actually a sorcerer in disguise. Using his knife, the sorcerer tears the girl's clothes and mentions something about a living virgin's face being important. Before the sorcerer can do more harm, a man named Zagan sneaks up from behind and grabs him. Zagan, the owner of the garden, demands to know why the sorcerer is causing trouble. Realizing he's in Zagan's territory, the sorcerer offers his research data in exchange for his freedom. Zagan refuses, stating he won't tolerate sorcery that involves harming others, and promptly dispatches the sorcerer. Witnessing the violence, the girl faints, and Zagan worries he may have gone too far. He restores everything to how it was, hoping the girl will think it was all a dream. Noticing a cross necklace on the girl, Zagan realizes she's associated with the church, enemies of sorcerers. Despite saving her, Zagan knows he'll likely be blamed for the attack but decides he doesn't care. He attempts to teleport the girl to safety, but someone's magic interferes with his spell. Zagan suspects it's the work of Barbaros and wonders if he's interrupted something. Zagan explains that he was just dealing with a troublemaker in his yard, and Barbaros notices the girl lying nearby has a good amount of mana. Barbaros wonders if Zagan plans to use her for a ritual sacrifice, but Zagan assures him that's not his style, and promptly teleports the girl away. Barbaros expresses disappointment, suggesting Zagan should have let him have the girl if he wasn't going to use her. Zagan brushes off the comment, saying he doesn't have time for such nonsense and needs to go to bed after staying up late reading sorcery books. As Zagan tries to leave, Barbaros stops him, suggesting he could wake up by tweaking his brain with adrenaline. Zagan retorts that such sorcery is what caused Barbaros to have his messed up appearance. Barbaros defends body manipulation as basic sorcery to maintain health and longevity, although they still have a limit of about a thousand years. Changing the subject, Barbaros reveals that one of the archdemons named Marcosius is dead, sharing interesting news with Zagan. 
Zagan is surprised to hear this news, explaining that becoming an archdemon grants immense mana and authority over lesser sorcerers. Archdemons are considered the top of the sorcery hierarchy, and out of the thirteen archdemons, the one who lived for a thousand years recently passed away. Barbaros mentions a significant auction happening in Marcosius's territory, where the late archdemons belongings will be up for sale. The scene shifts to Zagan heading to Marcosius's territory with Barbaros, realizing that Barbaros only informed him about the auction because he wants to borrow money. Barbaros suggests he might buy the legacy himself, but Zagan finds it unfair. Barbaros argues that Zagan is the only one who would lend him money, and if he does, he'll help him meet some nice girls. Zagan brushes off the idea, saying women cause more trouble than they're worth, and notices the city guards acting nervously. Barbaros explains that the city is tense due to a series of kidnapping, with some foolish people snatching women for sorcery experiments. Zagan finds this dangerous, noting it's akin to provoking the church. Barbaros speculates they might be attempting to summon a real demon, though Zagan considers it mere folklore. Descending underground for the auction, Barbaros reveals that Zagan is under suspicion for the kidnapping. Zagan denies involvement, stating he has no interest in such dark sorcery. Barbaros remarks that orchestrating the kidnappings would be beyond Zagan's capability, as he lacks the necessary allies. Arriving at the auction, Barbaros introduces the prominent figures present, including Veilfer the Apparition, Gremory the Enchantress, and Chimeris the Black Blade. Zagan explains that these second names are like titles for sorcerers. Barbaros informs Zagan that they are candidates to become the 13th Archdemon, now that old Marcosius is gone, and he himself is one of the candidates. Zagan wonders who decides the 13th Archdemon, and Barbaros explains it's determined by the remaining 12 Archdemons. Gremory also notices Barbaros, known as the Purgatory, and Zagan, and she questions why Zagan, who is young and lacks a title, is among the Archdemon candidates. The auctioneer then presents their final item, explaining it was meant for Archdemon Marcosius, but was left behind after his passing. They reveal it's an elf from the distant Norden Holy Land. Zagan is surprised to see the silver-haired elf, and the auctioneer emphasizes the elf's closeness to gods and natural spirits, making her magical properties highly valuable. Bidding starts at 10,000, and Zagan immediately bids 1 million for the elf, stunning everyone. Zagan is captivated by the elf's beauty, and desires to help her, make her smile, and touch her. He feels like he's found something unexpected and approaches the stage. Feeling socially awkward, Zagan wonders what to say to the elf and questions why she's chained. The host explains the collar contains her mana, preventing her from escaping. Zagan expresses a desire to talk to her and hear her voice, unintentionally giving the auction attendees the wrong impression. The scene shifts to Zagan in his castle with the girl, feeling unsure about what to do next after bringing her home. He knows he'll have to talk to her eventually, and runs through different conversation scenarios in his head, but none seem right. The elf then asks if she can ask a question, and Zagan finds her voice sweet. He encourages her to ask, and she wonders how she'll be killed, hoping to prepare herself. Zagan reassures her he won't harm her, but noticing the equipment in his room, she fears something worse than death. Zagan explains the equipment belonged to the castle's previous owner, and he has no interest in torture. He struggles to ask for her name, but before he can, the girl introduces herself as Nephilia. Zagan finds her name beautiful, and asks about her family name. Nephilia says she doesn't have one and suggests he call her Nephi. Zagan thinks her nickname is cute and asks if it's common for elves not to have family names. Nephilia explains that it's unusual, revealing she's a cursed child. She shows Zagan her undergarments, saying she's a virgin to reassure him, but he asks her to stop. Nephilia thought Zagan was worried she'd be used for experiments, but he assures he won't do that. She questions why he bought her, but Zagan evades, feeling embarrassed about his feelings for her. Despite his excitement about living together, he wants to maintain his dignity. Zagan offers her a room, asking her preferences. Nephilia jokingly wonders if he's asking where she wants to die, but Zagan reassures he won't harm her. He realizes Nephilia may have been sold as a slave and lied to about being a test subject or sacrifice. She doesn't want to discuss it and likely has no home. Zagan empathizes, sharing he didn't have a last name, grew up in the slums, and was called Yagan. He sees a connection between them. Zagan then explains to Nephilia that he bought her because he needed her, urging her not to speak of dying anymore. Nephilia is surprised by his words, but Zagan reassures her that from now on, she will live for his sake. She understands and follows him as he takes her to her room. Thinking she deserves a nice view, Zagan asks if she's afraid of heights. Nephilia replies that she isn't, so Zagan leads her to a room on the upper floors. 
While climbing the stairs, Nephilia stumbles, but Zagan catches her, reminding her to be careful. Feeling embarrassed, he continues holding her hand as they ascend. Upon reaching the topmost room, Zagan opens the door, only to quickly close it upon seeing a guillotine inside. Nephilia then suggests to Zagan that he can take her head if he wants to, but Zagan explains that the guillotine is just a trap to protect the castle from airborne enemies. He promises to get rid of it and uses his magic to remove everything from the room. Although the room is now uninhabitable, Zagan believes Nephilia shouldn't be scared anymore. However, Nephilia appears to be afraid of Zagan after witnessing his power. Zagan agrees that the room now feels gloomy, so Nephilia goes to the balcony. As she gazes at the moon, Zagan asks if she likes it. Nephilia replies that she doesn't know and wonders if it's okay for her to stay in this room. Zagan reassures her that it's fine as long as she doesn't mind the mess, and Nephilia says it's okay because this is the room her master prepared for her. Grateful, she thanks Zagan, surprising him as he hasn't been thanked in a long time. Nephilia adds that she hasn't thanked anyone in a long time either. This bring an end to episode 1. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more anime recaps. The anime with the age-old notion that heroes are the guardians of goodness, yet they often face betrayal or demise, either at the hands of their allies or their enemies. Despite their sacrifices to safeguard humanity, some folks fear their unrivaled might, choosing to slander or overlook them. This is the story of such a hero who sacrificed his life for peace, only to pray for tranquility in his next life as he breathed his last. In the next scene, a boy named Brett approaches our main character, Alan, and urges him to go to their father, who is waiting. As they part ways, Brett cruelly mocks Alan, remarking that their father is too kind to raise someone as worthless as him, contrasting his feelings towards having Alan as an elder brother. Although he feels ashamed, Brett believes it is time for a change. In the following scene, the father addresses Alan, reminding him that he was born into their family 15 years ago and has remained at level 1 since then. He expresses disappointment that Alan received no gift from God during the recent blessing ceremony, highlighting that everyone else receives one. Concluding that Alan has only brought disgrace to the family, the father decides to cast him out. Alan is ousted from his family, but he doesn't dwell on the loss. Instead, he embraces his newfound freedom with a sense of relief. Liberated from the burdens of his troublesome family, Alan sets out in search of the peace he craves. Reflecting on his restless past as a hero, he yearns for a calmer existence. Guided by a graceful butterfly, Alan embarks on a journey that leads him to the outskirts of his family's estate. Opting to explore the borderlands, he ventures into unknown territory, eager for a fresh start. Along the way, he pauses by a tranquil river, hoping to sustain himself with a humble catch of fish and longing for a simpler life. Perched atop a modest hill, Alan glimpses a peculiar sight in the distance. It's a young knight named Beatrice locked in a relentless battle with a resilient monster. Despite her valiant efforts, the creature repeatedly rises from defeat. Beatrice recounts how she and Princess Reese were ambushed by these creatures while traveling. Driven by her knightly duty, Beatrice fights to protect others from the looming threat. Beatrice takes a courageous stand to shield Princess Reese, urging her to flee for safety. Despite having the chance to escape herself, Beatrice refuses to leave anyone behind in peril. However, she reminds Reese of the vast difference between their status, emphasizing her duty as a mere knight compared to the princess. Meanwhile, from a distance, Alan observes the intense battle unfolding. Upon closer examination, he realizes that the demonic beasts are targeting none other than the kingdom's first princess, Princess Reese. Alan, empathizing with Reese's struggles, draws parallels to his own mistreatment in this life. Reese, who has faced constant criticism, has always shown kindness to Alan, regarding him as an exceptional individual. In appreciation for her kindness, Alan decides to tap into his latent powers, inherited from his previous life as a hero. However, before he can intervene, one of the demonic beasts lands a devastating blow on Beatrice, incapacitating her instantly. Alan harnesses his lightning speed agility and appears before Reese, who resigns herself to her fate. With a single powerful strike, Alan vanquishes all the demonic beasts, targeting their vulnerabilities with precision, rescuing Reese from certain peril. Not content with merely saving Reese, Alan employs his divine healing light magic to swiftly mend Beatrice's severe wounds, erasing her injuries in an instant. When questioned about his extraordinary ability, Alan attributes them to a recent divine blessing, concealing the truth of his inherited powers from his past life. Accepting Alan's explanation, Reese and Beatrice proceed to elaborate on their mission in the borderlands. Acting on a divine revelation, 
Reese is journeying to Clum Village, and Alan, unencumbered by familial ties, chooses to accompany them and offer his assistance. During their journey, Alan shares his painful experiences of mistreatment by his father, Craig, earning sympathy from Reese. Upon reaching Clum Village, they notice an unsettling silence enveloping the settlement. Beatrice's keen observation reveals that while the village appears inhabited, not a single door stands open, suggesting an abandoned state. Speculating on the cause, Beatrice suggests that marauding monsters from the borderlands may have ravaged the village. However, Alan's heightened senses, augmented by his presence detection magic, detect no signs of such threats. Their investigation leads them to a gathering of villagers, where an elderly man forcibly expels a young girl named Akira. Despite her diminutive stature, Reese recognizes Akira as the light prophesied in her divine revelation. Akira initially fails to recognize lies, prompting lies to recount their past encounters in the royal capital, where they shared meals together and formed a close bond. Apologizing for her forgetfulness, Akira promises not to overlook lies again, reconciling with her. Curious about Liza's earlier assertion regarding Akira's significance, Alan inquires about it. Lies explains the concept of a special blessing called Braver, which endows its recipient with the strength of a thousand warriors, essentially making them a hero. As Akira possesses this unique gift, she is deemed the hero of their generation. Lies, inspired by a divine revelation urging her to guide the light away from darkness, interprets this message as her duty to stand alongside the world's hero, explaining her presence in the borderlands. Gathering at a nearby bar for lunch, Akira elaborates on her mission to slay a dragon. She recounts encountering a frightened young girl on the nearby road, who pleaded for her assistance, claiming the villagers intended to sacrifice her to the dragon. Determined to investigate the situation, Akira embarked on her quest. Furthermore, when Akira is expelled from the village chief's house and encounters Alan's group, it becomes clear to Alan that the villagers intend to offer the young girl as a sacrifice to the dragon to gain its protection. He recognizes the desperation of the villagers resorting to such a cruel act to fend off monsters. Despite this, Alan intervenes to prevent Akira from slaying the dragon, understanding that such an action would only exacerbate the villagers' plight. Nevertheless, Akira opts to aid the young girl instead of appeasing the heartless villagers, and both Lies and Beatrice join her cause. Deciding to accompany them, Alan acknowledges that he has nothing better to do with his mundane existence. He expresses his belief that he cannot idly stand by while his dear friends are in danger. As the group approaches the mountain where the dragon supposedly dwells, Akira halts them to devise a strategic plan before engaging in battle. First, Akira settles onto the ground, encouraging the group to brainstorm ideas for defeating the dragon. Each person contributes their own plan, with one suggesting they approach the mountain peak via the main road while the others flank from behind. Alan volunteers to join Akira on the front lines, offering his strength to assist her. However, Akira declines his offer, suspecting that Alan would overshadow her efforts and monopolize the victory. Alan is surprised by Akira's keen insight into his character, considering their brief acquaintance. Akira explains that she can discern an unusual aura emanating from Alan, revealing his concealed power. Excited by this revelation, Akira proposes a sparring match with Alan after they deal with the dragon. With the plan in place, Akira departs first with a confident smile, exuding determination to confront the dragon alone. Meanwhile, Alan, Lies, and Beatrice chart their own course to the mountain peak, scaling large boulders to avoid detection by the dragon. As Akira faces off against the towering red dragon, Alan deduces that the villagers were coerced by his father, Duke Craig of Westfeld, into offering their children as sacrifice. Alan suspects that the Duke is leveraging the dragon's power through these sacrifices, explaining why the kingdom's royal knights haven't subdued the beast. Akira initiates the battle by unleashing a powerful lightning strike spell on the dragon, but to her dismay, it fails to inflict any harm. She realizes that defeating the dragon will be no easy feat. Furthermore, she spots the little girl she rescued earlier lying nearby, understanding that the dragon lured her in his bait. Disappointed by Akira's feeble attempt, the dragon scoffs at the notion that such a weak hero could be revered in this world. Akira faces the grim reality of her impending demise, recognizing the vast power gap between her and the formidable dragon. However, Alan refuses to stand idly by and watch her fall victim to the poorly rendered creature. With a single swift strike of his sword, he effortlessly brings down the dragon, showcasing the ease with which he wields his ultimate skill. As the battle concludes and the dragon's immortal life is extinguished by Alan's decisive blow, his sword shatters, symbolizing the shattered dream of a peaceful existence. Yet, he finds solace in the companionship of his newfound friends, realizing that their support transcends mere admiration for his strength. 
Upon waking up beside Reese, Alan apologizes for oversleeping, attributing it to the exhaustion from their encounter with the dragon. Curious about the well-being of the other girls, Alan learns that they are engaged in vigorous training, brimming with energy and determination. Moved by Reese's selfless acts of healing, Alan recalls the tales of a traveling healer renowned for her saintly deeds, realizing that the rumors surrounding her closely resemble Reese's own actions. Despite feeling remorse for not sharing this aspect of her life or Reese is comforted by Alan's understanding and support, reaffirming their bond regardless of her title or reputation. Touched by Alan's heartfelt words, Reese's spirits are lifted, and she expresses her profound gratitude. Encouraged by the camaraderie and warmth among them, one of the girls invites Alan to spar with her, prompting him to join them eagerly. The scene transitions to Alan bidding farewell to Akira, who requests to accompany them to the nearest village. Akira expresses her aversion to carriages, preferring to walk, while the little girl embraces her tightly, seeking reassurance from Reese if she's certain about taking care of her. Explaining her attachment to the girl and her desire to accompany her on the journey, Akira reveals the girl's lack of family and reluctance to return to the village. Apologizing for her sword, Akira receives assurance from Alan that its breakage wasn't her fault. He acknowledges her vital role in defeating the dragon and emphasizes that her unique sword belongs with her. Alan declares Akira as the true hero for the little girl and credits her indispensable contribution to their victory. Accepting Alan's words, Akira departs with the little girl, bidding farewell to Alan and his companion. Meanwhile, at the palace, Craig discusses the defeat of the Red Dragon King, revealing their plan to lure and eliminate the heroine. Angered by the saint's interference, Craig's assistant informs him of the saint's assistance to the girl, further frustrating Craig. Brett suggests deploying a massive herd of creatures for the next encounter but Craig cautions against risking more magical creatures. Craig's father intervenes, assuring that they're safe in the border area and will have ample opportunities to eliminate their targets. He instructs the assistant to locate the elves, vowing revenge on the kingdom once they're found. Back with Alan and the girls, he inquires about finding a blacksmith to craft him a new sword. Reese suggests a nearby blacksmith named Elvira and Granho, while Beatrice mentions another skilled but eccentric blacksmith named Ilf. Despite apologizing for involving him, Alan expresses gratitude, suggesting that he should be thankful in this instance. Regarding returning to the capital as a princess, Reese declines, citing Beatrice's presence and their successful contact with her father. Later, in a secluded part of the forest, Alan uses his magic to start a fire, much to the delight of the girls. They gather around the fire, and Reese inadvertently falls asleep on Alan's leg, quickly apologizing upon awakening. Beatrice chuckles and suggests, that since they're engaged, there's no harm in her sharing a sleeping space with Alan. Reese becomes irritated and informs Beatrice that Alan is her ex-fiancé. Alan intervenes, stating that there's no issue with Beatrice sleeping beside him, which surprises Reese, who then expresses her objection, catching Alan off guard. As time passes, both girls drift off to sleep. Alan reflects quietly, finding solace in the moment, noting that such serene companionship is a novelty in his second chance at life in this world. Recollecting their first encounter under the moonlight, Alan muses on the past, while an apparition of his former self appears beside him, admiring the beauty of the moon. Introducing herself as Risa Distilla, Reese expresses her eagerness to become acquainted with Alan, revealing her belief in their engagement. Alan, taken aback by this revelation, is brought back to reality, pondering that perhaps this tranquil interlude resembles the peace he once yearned for. The scene shifts to morning in Granholm Town, bustling with activity in the market square. Alan observes the liveliness of the town, which surprises him given its border location. Beatrice explains that adventurers and wanderers often converge there due to its strategic position. Arriving at the blacksmith's abode, Reese expresses confidence in the blacksmith's ability to forge a perfect sword for Alan. Beatrice finds it peculiar that amidst the typically audible clanging of swords, this particular blacksmith remains secluded, solely focused on her craft. Approaching the door, Alan discovers it open and leads the group inside where they find an array of formidable weapons. Impressed, Alan remarks on the superior quality of these weapons compared to his own broken sword. Suddenly, they hear Reese scream, and they rush to her side to find Noel collapsed on the ground. Beatrice holds her, explaining that this is a common occurrence. Noel often exhausts herself from overwork and falls asleep. They watch as Reese employs her healing magic to rouse her, prompting Alan to inquire if she uses magic every time to alleviate her fatigue. Reese confirms, admitting that she had forgotten about it due to the long interval since she last used her magic. Beatrice adds that when Noel undertakes the creation of a new sword, she becomes so absorbed in her work that she neglects eating and drinking until the task is complete. 
Once Noel awakens and notices Reese and Beatrice, whom she hasn't seen in a while, she inquires about the boy, Alan. Beatrice elucidates that he serves as a personal guard for Reese Sama and is known as Alan. Noel then asks if they wish for her to craft a new sword for him. She explains her current workload and the numerous orders she has received, indicating her inability to accommodate new requests. Furthermore, Alan already possesses a sword, albeit a broken one. Alan presents the broken sword to Noel for inspection, who discerns that it has been utilized to its fullest capacity, marveling at how someone could achieve such mastery. She reverses her decision and resolves to forge him a new sword. When Beatrice seeks clarification on whether she intends to craft a sword tailored for a hero, one that only a true hero can wield, Noel affirms, asserting that she will fashion a blade surpassing any in her collection, albeit requiring tremendous effort. Unable to decline, Alan agrees, prompting Noel to declare her immediate commencement of the task before ushering them out of her abode and shutting the door. Reflecting on Vanessa, a woman who once served as a blacksmith, Noel resolves to spare no expense in fashioning a sword that surpasses even the most supernaturally potent blade. Next, we find Alan traversing the forest with the girls. Reese voices her concern about Noel undertaking anything reckless. Alan suggests finding an inn to lodge in until the sword is completed. Suddenly, Molina appears and insists that this should be reported. Subsequently, she converses with Horace, expressing satisfaction with Reese's presence but raising questions about Alan's role as Reese's personal guard. Inquiring about Alan, Horace determines they need to investigate further. Beatrice advises him to rest, then proposes to Reese that Alan visit the Adventurers Guild during their downtime. There, he could potentially sell the materials procured from the dragon for a substantial sum. Alan agrees, mentioning his financial strain since his expulsion from his family. He bids farewell to the girls and departs. Beatrice then confers with Reese, expressing doubts about their plan's feasibility with only the two of them. While acknowledging this, Reese insists on minimizing Alan's involvement. The scene shifts to the Adventurer's Guild, where Alan is welcomed by the receptionist. He expresses his intent to exchange materials for money. The receptionist examines his items, notably surprised by the Dragon Scale's presence, deeming it exceedingly valuable alongside the other assorted items. She takes the items to inform the manager. Meanwhile, Alan finds himself conversing with Maylene and her assistant, who express curiosity about the dragon. Horace introduces himself and Maylene, noting her status as an Amazon, a rarity in the kingdom. Despite their imposing appearance, they lack insight into adventuring and seek knowledge from experienced adventurers. Horace queries Alan about his acquisition of the dragon scale, wondering if he faced the dragon alone or with allies. Alan admits to needing assistance, prompting Horace to inquire if the heroine accompanied him, presuming the battle was exhilarating. As the receptionist concludes her evaluation, Horace and Maylene depart, discussing their impressions of Alan. Horace remarks on the necessity of assessing Alan's capability, though he didn't anticipate him being bereft of divine gifts, rendering him inconsequential as an opponent. Noel's expression shifts to one of astonishment upon seeing Horace, but she quickly returns her focus elsewhere. Meanwhile, Horace instructs Maylene to shadow Alan discreetly, emphasizing the importance of secrecy to avoid potential complication. With a nod, Maylene vanishes from sight. The scene returns to Alan, who vigorously tests the sword's capabilities by dispatching numerous monsters. Expressing his satisfaction, Alan praises the sword's quality to Noel. Taking the sword in hand, Noel channels her magical prowess, augmenting its strength and sharpness beyond the ordinary eye's perception. She discerns the sword's condition intricately and enhances its speed and precision through her magic. Impressed by Alan's skill in wielding the sword without a scratch, she suggests challenging stronger adversaries. Leading Alan deeper into the forest as night descends, they find their campfire still burning brightly. Noel remarks on the unusual absence of monsters, speculating that they might have fled in fear of confronting Alan. However, Noel's anxiety surfaces as she recalls her mentor Vanessa's advice to flee upon encountering formidable adversary. Encouraging Alan, she urges him to awaken a slumbering monster and engage it with his sword, her voice resounding in the forest. This bring an end to our episode 1 and 2.